speaking in Jesus' name that, Lord, your intention for speaking to us, that intention will be fulfilled and your desire will be realized in every life. Lord, be magnified and glorified in every life here today in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. A good amen. amen. Thank you. I just love to know that you're still there. We're looking at Mark chapter 10. And from Mark chapter 10, I'm reading to you from verse 2. And the Pharisees came to him and asked him, Is it lawful for a man and for a man to put away his wife, tempting him? And he answered and said unto them, What did Moses command you? Here we find what happened between the Lord Jesus Christ and the Pharisees. Actually, the Lord Jesus had been teaching the word because it was the word personified. And there was nothing else for him to do except to teach the word, the way of life, and the way of truth. And that's what he was doing with the people that were listening to him. But the Pharisees were always around. And if you know anything about the Pharisees, the Pharisees were not entering into the kingdom of God. And neither would they want any other person to listen to the word of God and to enter into the kingdom. They actually wanted to become a shield against the truth. That means they didn't want to hear, neither did they want those disciples of Jesus or any other one coming to Jesus to hear. And therefore, they always had a question in their mind. And it will be a burning question. There was a burning controversy among the religious people of those days, at the time of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the burning controversy concerned marriage, divorce, and remarriage. Actually, there were two schools of thoughts. The Shammite school of thought were very, very conservative. And those conservative people said, your marriage, your marriage. And there should be nothing to separate you. There should be nothing to make you seek a divorce. Except they put one clause. But by and large, they were very, very conservative. But there was another school of thought, the Hillel school of thought. They were very, very liberal. And they said, if you find anything you dislike, anything you don't appreciate in that woman, kick her out, separate from her divorce her and there were many many people on one side multitudes too on the other side and what they wanted to do for the lord jesus christ to set him against at least one of those groups if jesus was conservative the liberal people in his congregation that were listening to him then they thought he will not be appreciated by them. They will immediately say, ah, he is conservative. He is in the other school of thought. And therefore, we ought to not to listen to him. If he sounded liberal, that of course, if there is any problem between you and the woman, you are at liberty kicker out. Then the conservative people are going to be against her and the women too that were suffering unnecessarily in the hands of those men at home, they were going to be against him. And so, the intention of these Pharisees was, number one, discredit him. Number two, destroy his ministry. Number three, drive away his disciples. Number one, they wanted to discredit him. After all, 
is not a better teacher than any other person is not a better leader than any other person he couldn't be the christ he couldn't be the messiah he is the same as the Shammai school or he is the same as the healer school is either conservative or is liberal discredit him he cannot be the messiah number two destroy his ministry because many many people are already musing and thinking and meditating can this be the christ he opens the eyes of the blind is making the lame to walk is teaching the word with authority and is teaching the way into the kingdom and he cares not for any man and therefore the people were so eager multitudes were running out time ask him this burning question and get him into a controversy and distract his attention and then you will destroy his ministry and then when you do that number three drive away his disciples all these people that have left us the members of the sanhedrin and they're running after the lord jesus christ we're going to destroy his ministry but if you know anything about the lord jesus christ he always uses the firewood of his enemies to prepare rich spiritual nourishing meal for his friends note what i said you know anything about the lord jesus christ he always 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 uses the firewood of his enemies to prepare rich nourishing spiritual meal for his friends and so as he came with their question thinking he's going to side either this school or that school instead of siding anyone he went back to the origin the beginning of the teaching concerning marriage in an organized form in a systematic form to the children of israel what did moses command you they answered that after they answered that he said let's go back still further mark chapter 10. in mark chapter 10 verse 6 but from the beginning of the creation of god he made them male and female for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they twain shall be one flesh so then they are no more twain but one flesh the lord jesus directed them back to the beginning and whenever you have any question in your mind always go back to the beginning whenever you have any doubt in your mind always go back to the beginning if there are some passages of scriptures you read in either matthew or mark or luke or romans or first corinthians any passage of scripture you're reading concerning marriage concerning the family and it's getting you confused there is something you can always do you can always go back to the very beginning of the institution of marriage that's exactly what jesus called those pharisees and those confucianists and those people that were listening to him that's what he told them to do go back to the beginning and then you will find the divine prescription for a happy marriage and a blessed family that's what we're talking about today divine prescription for a happy marriage and a blessed family the lord wants us to have a happy marriage and he has given us all the prescriptions in the world and then a blessed family and the lord has given us all that we need to know about the blessed family now you understand uh, whenever you buy a piece of machinery a machine and in these days of the computer there are many many kinds of computers that are made always the manufacturers will send the handbook 
that will go along or the machine that they have made. And what do you do? If you don't want that machine to get spoiled, you're not going to begin to use that machine as you go through the handbook. How do I open it up? How do I operate it? How do I search for information? How do I get the input in? How do I get the output out? How do I do this? How do I design that? You will find if you are a person that will read the manual, it doesn't matter the kind of machine that is given to you. If you can read the manual very well and follow line after line, paragraph after paragraph, action after action, you'll find that machine will last long. It will last long because you are following the prescription that, the, that has been written in the manual by the makers of those machines. Well, uh, the greatest institution on earth is the institution of marriage, the first institution of the Lord. And if you want that marriage to be a happy marriage, a blessed family, go back to the instruction, the prescription, the manual that the Lord has given. Because it's only in doing that, that you'll be able to make up a happy union in marriage and a blessed family that will answer to the original purpose and plan of God in that union in the family. And that's what we're doing today. We're looking at this, Mark chapter 10. And we're looking at the question and the answer. And we're then looking at what the Lord himself has ordained, how the marriage should be, and how the family should be. And while we're going through, in your own mind, you ought to be thinking through on your personal life, on your marriage, as well as on your family. Are we operating this machine? Contrary to the directives and the directions that the manufacturer has made, that he has given. Are we operating in our families, in our marriage, in a way that is different from what the Lord has instituted, prescribed, and given unto us? And any way you find a difference between the way you operate in your family, and the way the Lord has stipulated in the word of God, then you are going to say, Lord, I'm taking a decision today. I'm going to now begin to operate and to act and to live and to function in my family as you are prescribed in your word. Please go with me to Mark chapter 10. I'm now reading from verse 2. I'm reading all the way to verse 12. And the Pharisees came to him and asked him, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife, tempting him? And he answered and said unto them, What did Moses command you? And they said, Moses suffered us. Moses suffered to write a bill of divorcement and to put her away. And Jesus answered and said unto them, for the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this precept. But from the beginning of the creation of God, the creation, God made them male and female. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. And that way shall be one flesh. So then, there are no more twain but one flesh what therefore god has joined together let no man put asunder and in the house his disciples asked him again of the matter and he said unto them whosoever shall put away his wife and marry another committed adultery against her and if a woman shall put away her husband and be married to another she committed adultery as we look at this passage i divide the message to three parts number one 
God's permissive will for hardened hearts. God's permissive will for hardened hearts. Number two, God's perfect will for happy homes. God's perfect will for happy homes. Number three, God's permanent way to the heavenly habitation. I come back to number one. God's permissive will for hardened hearts. Man's perverted will and hardened heart will keep him from the truth that will save him, the truth that will bless him. And eventually, hardened hearts abandon the perfect will of God and they settle down to what they know to be the permissive will of God. But we need to sound a note of warning. When hardened hearts lead anyone to permissive will, such an individual will reap the devastating harvest of their choice. Hardened heart or hardness of heart will produce, number one, disobedience to God. Will know the perfect will of God. Will know the standard of the Lord. Will know the word of the Lord. But when there is hardened heart, it's going to lead, number one, to disobedience against God. Number two, it's going to lead to rebellion against the will of God. Maybe the will of God in the choice of a life partner. Maybe the will of God after marriage is staying together. It may be the will of God in walking and serving and living in the kingdom. It may be the will of God. It may be the will concerning God's intention and purpose and plan for your life. Where you live, where you stay, which church you go, how you read the word, how you believe the word. If there is hardness of heart, number two, there's going to be rebellion against God's will. Number three. If there is hardness of heart, there's going to be bitterness and hatred against the wife or against the husband of your youth. You have gotten married together. And then there are some challenges, there are some problems. There is no rose without some thorns. And there is no road without some dust. And there is no sunshine without some heat. There is no rainfall without some cold. And there is no situation in life without some challenges. Challenges are going to be there. In any community in which you find yourself, in any home in which you find yourself, when you allow those problems, and those difficulties and those challenges to bring a lasting, permanent hatred and bitterness against your wife or against your husband, the result is going to be hardness of heart. And the hardness of heart will lead to another thing, unforgiveness and cruelty. You'll be dealing with that woman or with that husband, even when you have not separated, even when you have not dis divorced. You're going to be dealing with that individual as if she's worse than stranger, or he is worse than a stranger. There'll be cruelty, there'll be thoughtlessness, and it is the hardness of heart. The Lord will be telling you. Is this woman a human being or an animal? The way you are relating with her, dealing with him, is this man a human being? Is he an enemy? Is he a friend? Or is he husband? And the conviction of becoming in the heart, but hardness of the heart will continue with that attitude of unforgiveness and cruelty. It is hardness of heart that also results 
in selfishness. That's the thing that brings a breaking up in family. Selfishness. And you will not think on the implication of that separation and the divorce. You are not going to think of the implication on the children. What do you think about a family? That even though they might even not be divorced, they are separated. And the mother is not able to take care of those infants, primary school children, or those young children. The, the mother is not able to take care of them because there is a decision that came out of unforgiveness and selfishness. And you only consider yourself without thinking of the implication on the people that are connected with their family. It's the hardness of heart that eventually results in separation and divorce. And then there will be self-imposed suffering. And of course, eventually, it will lead to the judgment of God. And it will lead to eternal punishment. Because later, even after you have died, those children that are neglected... There will be sinful, criminal posterity. That's the reason you need to think through and think about this permissive will of God that comes as a result of hardness of heart. Come back to that. Mark chapter 10 again from verse 2. And the Pharisees came to him and asked him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife, tempting him? And he answered and said unto them, What did Moses command you? Always go back to the word. And they said, Moses suffered us. You know, look at that word. Moses suffered us. He didn't command us. It wasn't a commandment. It was just a permission. He allowed us. He permitted us. He suffered us. To write a bill of divorcement and to put her away. And Jesus answered and said unto them, For the hardness of your heart wrote he to you this precept. In Deuteronomy chapter 31, we see the condition of the children of Israel that was well known to Moses, the man of God. Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 27. For I know thy rebellion and thy stiff neck. Behold, while I am yet alive with you this day, ye have been rebellious against the Lord. And how much more after my death? Moses confronted these children of Israel, he said, I know your rebellion. I know your stiff neck. I know your hardness of heart. Even while I'm still here with you, and of course I know, you are going to do much more after my death. And so Jesus said, for you, Pharisees, Sadducees, Israelites, the children of rebellious forefathers had in hearts. Moses permitted that. That wasn't the perfect will of God. That wasn't the way of the Lord. Divorce is not the will of God. And it's like the Lord was telling them, What do you think I'm different from Moses? Moses could not change your heart. But I am come because I can change your heart. Because I'm the Christ, because I can forgive the Son of Man, has power on earth to forgive sin and to transform life. And I'm removing the hardness of heart away from you. And everything that came in line with the hardness of heart, I am removing. All these sins that have been on for thousands of years, they were there, cruelty to the woman. Unforgiveness towards the husband. Non-challenged attitude towards the children. Wickedness, separation and divorce, tearing apart that had been because of hardness of heart. That's the reason Christ came. 
that he will remove the hardness of heart in salvation, in cleansing the heart, in transforming the life. And then love will take the place of hatred. And once the hardness of heart is removed, then all the permission that came as a result of that hardness of heart is also taken away. Now please understand, the hardness of heart among the children of Israel was not a private knowledge of only Moses. Even the other people in the Old Testament, they knew that Israelites had hardness of heart. Nehemiah chapter 9 verse 16. In Nehemiah chapter 9 verse 16, but they and our fathers dealt proudly and hardened their necks and hearkened not to the commandment to thy commandments in verse 26 nevertheless they were disobedient and rebelled against thee and cast thy law behind their backs and slew thy prophets which testified against them to turn them to thee and they wrought great provocations that's the reason why you'll find in the old testament that the lord will say you want to have your way that's all right go ahead it wasn't his perfect will it wasn't his normal commandment but because they had made up their minds that they were going to do what they were going to do then he said go your way did that mean then he will bless them since it was the permissive will of God? And that's where we need to really pay attention now. When God gives you his perfect will, and he says, this is a way, walk ye therein. And you say, no, I'm going to go my way. I'm going to have my heart in heart. And I'm sure I'm going to bend the hand of God, the mind of God. And eventually God will have no choice. God will have to agree that I will go my way. Suppose God allows a man, a woman to go his way. And then the man can say, God, you permitted me. Does that mean that everything then will go fine? Let's see. In Psalm 81, verses 11 and 12. Verse 11 some 81 but my people will not hack into my voice israel will none of me so i give them up unto their own hearts lost and they watch in their own counsels i give them up i said whatever your eyes see good luck to you i give them up Whatever suffering you plunge yourself into by allowing permissive will, that's your cup of tea. He gave them up. Whatever suffering, whatever chastisement, and whatever destruction, devastation came upon them, that was of their own making. He gave them up. You see, the permissive will of God in any area, it may be in the area of trying to get married. And then you have an idol in your heart. And you say, I will go my way. Let them teach what they want to teach. Let them say what they want to say. I know eventually, if I keep on saying, that's what I'm going to do. That's what I'm going to do. That's what I'm going to do. And they call me and they warn me. After all their lengthy talk and lengthy counseling and opening many passages of the Bible, I still tell them, I'm sorry, this is what I'm going to do. Eventually, they'll give up. Of course, they're going to give you up eventually. But don't you think that because they have given up and because now you have your own way because of hardness of heart, don't think because of that there's no judgment. In Psalm 106, verse 15, He gave them their heart's desires, their heart's request, but sent leanness into their soul. That's the permissive will of God. He gave them their request. That's what we want. That's the way we want to go. Give it to us. Don't hinder us. 
Yes, we know what we are teaching in the word of God. But in these days in which we are living, who can live like that? See what the woman has done. And see what the way the, the man is behaving. Why are you telling me not to divorce? Why are, you not, why are you telling me not to remarry? Leave me alone. And then you'll begin to see some dreams that will be telling you, you can remarry. You begin to hear some voices that will be telling you, it's alright to divorce. And you see, I had the voice. It was clear. I know how God speaks to me. I saw the dream. Very, very similar to the dream when I was going to get married. I know how God leads me. And I know this is very sure. If the leaders in the church don't understand, if my Christian friends don't understand, it's they misunderstanding because I know how God speaks to me. You are going to suffer for that thing because that is not the perfect will of God. In Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 24. In Romans chapter 1, verse 24, you will see how God gives up the people that want to go their own way. Verse 24, wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts. To dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Verse 26. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections. Maybe you want to get married. And then you are yielding to the flesh. And instead of waiting for the will of God, you say, this is what I will do. Your flesh is speaking louder than your preacher. Your flesh is pushing you more than any other thing will act on you. And therefore you say, that's the way I am going to go. And if this song will break my fellowship with the church, it's unfortunate. If they will not allow me to do this, it's unfortunate. I must do it. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. For even the women did change the natural use into that, which is against nature. In verse 28, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. You see, when somebody hears the word of God, he knows the mind of God, he knows this is the perfect will of God. Now, concerning marriage, that once you are married, whether you married before you got born again, or you married after you got born again, marriage is permanent. It is until death do you part. But when you are encountering problems, and you are thinking that your friends and your neighbors that you see outside, and all these good, good, nice looking people who are sitting down calmly and gently, and they're always, you know, they're always smiling and always happy. You think they don't have any problems. They don't ever have any, they don't ever have any disagreement. And you say, why am I so different? Ask them questions if they tell you the truth. They tell you there's no rose without thorns, and there's no sunshine without heat, and there is no road without dust, there's no, and there's no good thing without its challenges. The challenges are there. It's only that these other people you find smiling and holding one another, and eating together, and staying together, and planning together, and they're having a happy marriage. It's because every day, whatever happens, they put all those things behind them. They forgive and they forget. And if you see that the teeth and the tongue, they have for all these 50 years, and we have not tried to extract the teeth, and we didn't try to cut off the tongue, it is not because sometimes the tongue doesn't bite, the, and if the teeth doesn't bite the tongue, it is just that we learn to live together. It's just that, you know, as the teeth will bite the tongue, and then you feel the pain, then the very next meal, the teeth is still chewing, and the tongue is still swallowing, everything is still going on. It is not because there's no problems. But as you're looking at the marriages of other people, and you're thinking they're enjoying, they're going through life, there are no challenges, and look at me. And then, I want to have a blessed marriage like theirs. And then you want to have a second marriage or a third marriage, or a fourth marriage, if you make up your mind that you don't want to listen to the word of the Lord, the Lord will leave you alone. But, 
the suffering will follow that permissive will. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 10. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. For this cause God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie. You might find some other preachers coming to you, and they'll give you their delusion, their, dece uh, their deception, and they will tell you it doesn't matter. What are they telling in your own church? If a man is, you know, caring, is not caring for you, and is not bringing the food money, and is not bringing pocket money, treating you like a primary school girl, who tells you to remain there? Come out of there. And then that delusion, you will believe it. You will accept it. You will say, after all, all the preachers also said, and because of what all the preachers also said, then you will go outside that marriage, you will separate, you will divorce, and you'll think you're justified. It says, because you do not have the love of the truth. The problems that you are going through in your family blindfolded you to the truth. The challenges you are facing in your family will blindfold you to the truth because you do not have the a love of the truth. It says there will be that deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Uh, let me remind you, let me just show you a quick, a good example uh, to make you remember that the permissive will of God does not set you free from punishment. That God said, okay, that's what you want to do, all right, go ahead. You need a dream to confirm, you can go ahead and allow you to have a dream. You need a counselor that will counsel you that I've told you the perfect will that I have. But you don't want my perfect will. You want permissive will. And you need a dream, I'll give you a dream. You need a counselor, I'll give you a counselor. And you need advisors, I'll give you advisors. Do you need one verse of the Bible so that you can be convinced you want to go your way? I'll give you a verse of scripture. And then once you have that, then you're, you're rejoicing, you're dancing, you're going about. And if anybody tries to challenge you, you say, they don't understand. They don't understand the dream God gave me. They don't understand the counseling that I had from a great man of God. They don't understand the verse I found. I said, oh Lord, if this sin is not your will, uh, because they're saying don't remarry, don't divorce, uh, when we go to church today, give me a song. And then, as the choir is singing, let me pick up something there that will show me that this is your will for me. And true, true, as the choir is singing, you hear a particular sentence there in the song. Then you hold it, you say, aha, I am sure now God has permitted me, I can kick up this man that is still treating me. I can separate, I can divorce. And then you go ahead with that permissive will. And don't think you will not suffer. You are going to suffer here on earth and in hell if you don't repent and come out of that permissive will in Numbers chapter 22 verse 7. Numbers chapter 22 verse 7. And the, elder, the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the rewards of divination in their hand. And they came unto Balaam and spake unto him the words of Balak. And he said unto them, Lodge here this night, and I will bring you word again, as the Lord shall speak to me. And the, and the princes of Moab abode with Balaam. And God came unto Balaam and said, What men are these with thee? And Balaam said unto God, Balaam the son of Zippor, king of Moab, as sent them, as sent unto me, saying, Behold, there is a people come out of Egypt, which covereth the face of the earth. Come now, and cost me them. Peradventure, I shall be able to overcome them, and drive them out. 
And God said unto Balaam, Thou shalt not go with them. For they shall, thou shalt not cause the people, for they are blessed. That's the perfect will of God. Perfect will of God. Balaam, don't go. Then in verse 13, and Balaam rose up in the morning and said unto the princes of Balak, Get you into your land. For the Lord refused to give me leave to go with you. And the princes of Moab rose up, and they went unto Balak, and said, Balaam refuses to come with us. And, and verse 15, and Balaam, Balak sent yet again, princes more and more honorable than they. And they came to Balaam, and said unto him, Thus says Balak, the son of Zippo, let nothing, I pray thee, hinder thee from coming unto me. For I will promote thee unto very great honor. And I will do whatsoever thou sayest unto me. Come therefore, I pray thee, cause me this people. And Balaam answered and said unto the servants of Balak, If Balak will give me a son full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the word of the Lord my God to do less or more. Now therefore I pray you tarry ye also here this night, that I may know what the Lord will say unto me more. You wanted to go. The Lord had revealed his perfect word. Balaam, don't go. Don't go and curse the people. Don't run that kind of errand. Don't leave your place. Stay where you are. And then... He told the people, I cannot go. I cannot leave my place. I'm going to stay where I am. Because here is the perfect will of God for me. And then the saint back. When the saint back, he should have known God. I am God. I change not. But he said, let me see whether God has changed. Because really I want to go. How can a person lose such an amount of money like this? How can somebody miss something like this? Uh-uh. See this man that wants to marry me. They say, don't marry unbeliever. And they say, we should marry believers. And the believers that have been coming, they have no cars, they have no money, they have no house, they are still renting, face me, I face your house. And these southern man unbeliever, they are calling him, and he has money, and he has car, and has, you know, an apartment, a bungalow, and he even opportunity to travel overseas. And they say, don't marry this man. Okay, I say no. And then the people send again. And he said, what are you thinking about? You want to marry Christian. Those Christians, what do they have that I don't have? I will do this, I will do this, I will do that. And then you say, okay, let me pray. Because I'm a child of God. Anything I do. I've made up my mind that I'm always going to pray. What are you praying about? Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. That is a standing everlasting unchangeable irreversible word of god and when you go to pray about it you're looking for trouble you're looking for a permissive will and it's going to land you in perdition and so this balaam he said hey, let me pray about it again and see what the lord will say unto me more verse 20 and God came unto Balaam at night and said unto him, If the men come to call thee, rise up and go with them. Ah, praise the Lord. What if I didn't check up again? What if I didn't find out again? I would have lost that money just like that. But now see what the Lord has said. You know, if you persist on your way, if you keep, even God, you change the mind of God. If you keep on telling God, oh God, why now? Why shouldn't I do it? Why shouldn't I divorce? Why shouldn't I, uh, why shouldn't I drive this woman away? Why shouldn't I separate? You know, I've discovered something. If you keep on telling God and telling God and telling God and say, God, you know, if you don't do this for me, I will backslide. If you don't allow me to do this, I will backslide. If you don't allow me to separate from this man, I'll stop coming to church. Okay? Then God will say, okay, you can do it. Ah, praise the Lord. This God is wonderful. This God is very considerate. This God is very loving. This, he understands our faith. He understands that we are flesh. You know now, God has permitted me. Balaam, 
there is death in front of you there is judgment waiting for you because that permissive will of god will land you into the judgment of god in verse 22 remember god said go verse 22 and god's anger was kindled because he went and the angel of the lord stood in the way and for an adversary against him the lord told him to go he didn't understand that it was because he was putting pressure on god and see verse 33 and the ass saw me the angel was talking to balaam and turned from me these three times unless she had turned from me surely now also I had slain thee, I would have slain you and saved her alive. And so you understand then when you're talking of the permissive will of God that comes as a result of hardened hearts, it's actually, it actually comes with the judgment of God. I go to point number two God's perfect will for happy homes. God's perfect will for happy homes we come to mark chapter 10 in mark chapter 10 reading from verse 6 mark chapter 10 verse 6 but from the beginning of the creation god made them male and female for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife and it way shall be one flesh so then they are no more twain but one flesh what therefore god has joined together let not man put asunder here we find the perfect will of god as we look at these verses, it says, God's perfect and only will, number one, is revealed from the beginning. You want to know perfect will of God? Go back to Adam and Eve. Go back to the very beginning. Because we're told God made them male and female. One Adam, one Eve that whatever happened in that family there was no provision for divorce now think about what eve did eve the mother of us all was the one that ate the forbidden fruit and gave that fruit to adam and it was as a result of that adam lost the garden of eden it was because of what eve did that eventually God cursed the earth. And it was because of that suffering came upon Adam. And God said, in the sweat of your face, you will eat for the rest of your life. Talk about losing the home. Talk about losing the garden. Talk about losing privilege. Talk about losing authority talk about losing happiness and talk about problem it was because of what eve did and yet even with all that problem god did not make an allowance a provision for adam to separate or to divorce eve and the lord is saying in your marriage whatever the woman has done go back to the beginning and compare it with what happened in the first family and you're still going to find it is male and female one man one wife until death do us part go back to the beginning what separated adam and eve only death and then he tells us for this cause shall a man leave father and mother and cleave to his wife that is he made them to leave father and mother incidentally at that time there was no father for adam 
no murder for Adam. And incidentally, for us to know that the intention of God is this perfect union between Adam and Eve. It was from that beginning that these living father and mother and cleaving to the wife, it was then the Lord established that precept. In Genesis chapter, 20, chapter 2 verse 24, Genesis chapter 2 verse 24, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Do you see that when God created Adam and Eve, and he joined them together into one unit in marriage as a family, the Lord said, therefore, because of what I have done concerning this Adam and this Eve, this is how marriage, family will continue on earth. Therefore, shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. That means the bond between husband and wife is stronger than the bond between parents and children. Have you ever thought about it? There are things that children do that normally some of the parents will just have said, you're not my child anymore. We'll just cut off from those children. But it doesn't happen. You mothers there, you know. When a child has become like a criminal, and everybody in society has nothing to do with that child, you're still with that child. You're holding on to that child. You're staying with that child. You're pleading with that child. You're loving that child. There is a bond between father, mother, and the children. And yet, the bond of marriage is greater, is stronger than that of parents and children. Because we can leave father, we can leave mother, but we can never leave the wife. There is no cleaving. There is no joining. There is no total, eternal, final staying with the child. The child is going to live one day, but the husband is never to leave the wife. And the wife is never to leave the husband. The bond between husband and wife is stronger than the bond between parents. And if you cannot cut off permanently those children, then you cannot cut off your wife permanently. You cannot cut off your husband permanently. Therefore, shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be what? Tell me out loud. One flesh. One flesh. That means in the mind of God, you are so joined together that you are not two people just agreeing together. You are not two different individuals just tolerating one another. You actually become one flesh. What's the implication of that? It's like this. Somebody had an accident. And because he had accident, a part of the flesh had been either burnt or cut off. And it's a visible part of the flesh. And so in the hospital, they want to graft in another part of flesh. And they look at his body. And if they're not able to find a part in the body that they're going to join that with, maybe they look for another flesh somewhere. And then they test the blood and do everything. And they graft it in and sew it up. And then it gets ill. And that flesh that is joined to that body is now one flesh with this fellow that had accident before. And that flesh will remain with him until the day of his death. That's what the Lord is saying. That the husband and the wife, in the mind of God, 
they cleave together, they join together, they become one flesh as the bone cleaves to the flesh. And as believers cleave to God. Do you know that that word, sacred word, cleave, is the word that is used for believers. That you will love the Lord your God. You will obey his commandments and you will cleave unto God. And the same word that is used to tell us about not backsliding, not separating from God, not disfellowshipping yourself from God, that you will cleave unto God. That same word is used for husband and wife. For this cause shall a man leave the father and the mother and cleave unto his wife. And they are no more twain, but they become one flesh. That's why the Lord also emphasized what God therefore has joined together. Let not man put asunder anyone. Let not the husband himself put asunder. Let not wife put asunder. Let not the in-laws put asunder. Let not friend cause separation or divorce. Because any friend, anyone, any advisor that is causing that separation or divorce is working against God and is fighting against the Lord. And then the Lord said, Whosoever shall put away his wife and marry another, he commits adultery against her. When you put away your wife, whatever reason you have, she's done this, she's done that. She's wrecking my life. She's destroying my business. Since we got married together, I, I've not been able to have progress. Or uh, since we got married, there's no child. Or this and that. If you kick her out and you marry another, the word of the Lord Jesus said, you are living in adultery. And if you die as an adulterer, you will go to the adulterer's hell. And then the Lord Jesus said, if a woman shall put away her husband and be married to another, she committed adultery. And for that woman to die in that condition of adultery is to spend eternity in hell fire. And that's why the Lord is telling us we need to come back to the word and stay with the word of the Lord. It tells us in Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, reading from verse 22. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. This is how to keep the marriage together. Wives, you have your role to play. You have your part to play. There is no good thing that just happens accidentally. Good marriages do not grow up accidentally. And good families are not reared accidentally. You'll never find a woman saying, you know, I never even did anything about it. You're asking me how I've had a good marriage, a happy marriage, a blessed family. I just find that, you know, the marriage is happy and, and wonderful. And I never do anything about it. But I just, I just act as if the man is not there. And I just do whatever I want to do anytime. And, you know, I just have a happy marriage. Never, never, it never happens. If you're going to have a happy marriage, a blessed family, you have a price to pay. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Married man, you go out in the morning and then you walk all through the day. Then you come back in the night. You never smile at home. You never do any good thing at home. And you never even care. You are not considerate at home. 
and you're saying, you know, I'm just expecting because I claim it by faith. Happy marriage and blessed family. I claim it by faith. It's not going to happen that way. There's a price to pay. And there is sacrifice. You have to do something about it before you will have a happy marriage and a blessed family. And if you are the type, you never discuss with the wife. You never open up your mind to the wife. You never ask the wife what she's going through. And you never show any kind of love, mercy, compassion. You are never considerate. And you don't know, you don't know what she feels. You cannot really, you've been together now for 10 years, for 20 years, for 30 years. You cannot read her mood. And you cannot read when she's sad from the facial expression. And she will have to, you know, say, husband, I, I don't know. You've not been watching at all for this uh, one week now. I thought you would have seen from the color of my face and the appearance of my face that, you know, something is wrong. I needed your attention. You never, you have never studied. You only study Bible and study books and study newspapers. You never study your wife. Marriages don't get blessed that way. You will know what it means to love. Husbands, love your wives. Even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. In verse 28, so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. After all, you are one flesh now. And because you are one flesh, that is why you will love her as your own body. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. And of course, he that hateth his wife hateth himself. He that abandons his wife abandons his himself. And he that is keeping something away from the wife is keeping something away from himself. He that tortures the wife is torturing himself. He that ill treats the wife is still treating himself. Look at the wife as part of your flesh. And then what you are to do to yourself is what you do to her. It says, he that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hateth his own flesh. But nourishes and cherishes it, even as they love the church. For we are members of his body and flesh of his flesh, bone of his bone. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother? Shall a man leave his father and mother? What does that mean? Husband, saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, worker, leader, preacher. He has married and is living inside the house for the wife and the mother. You are not in the perfect will of God. Actually, if we knew all the truth about such a family that person should not be preaching anything in the church should not be coordinating anything in the church should not be working at all in the church therefore the basic thing when a person has not even gone through the primary school how can he teach at the university when a man does not know enough to leave father and mother and cleave to his wife how can you make him a teacher some of our brothers sisters here they've been in this school of uh, the kingdom of god for more than 20 years and then you take somebody who says he's a preacher who has not left father and mother what we should have learned at the primary school level of christianity to leave the father to leave the mother and cleave to his wife it's not even done that how can we bring him to be teaching people who are already adults and matured in the Lord? If you say you're a Christian, and you're a Christian leader, and your junior brothers and junior sisters and senior brothers and uncle and father and mother, they're living there with you, and the wife is there, and then you are sharing your love between your mother and your father. And at night, wife cannot get your attention because you are with your mother. You are discussing. Any decision you want to take, mother will decide it with you first before you tell the wife. 
Are you a Christian? A Christian is supposed to Christian not to be in the Bible, not to be in the Word of God. If you're going to have a scriptural marriage, here is the very first principle of the Word of God. For this cause, for this reason, shall a man leave father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. As you read it in Genesis, one flesh. You read it in Matthew, one flesh. You read it in Mark, one flesh. You read it in Ephesians, one flesh. How can we say it over and over, and yet we never get it? We will get it. I said we will get it. And the Lord will keep on blessing us in Jesus' name. From this day, your marriage will be different. In Songs of Solomon chapter, Song of Solomon chapter 8, Song of Solomon chapter 8, verses 6 and 7. In Song of Solomon chapter 8, verse 6, set me as a seal upon thine heart, as a seal upon thine arm, for love is strong as death. Remember where we're coming from, where we're coming from. Love your wife as Christ loves the church. That love should be as strong as death. Jealousy is cruel as the grave. The coals thereof are coals of fire, which has a most vehement heat. You know what it says, flame. What it says here, the kind of love you have for your wife should be a kind of love that your wife will feel. That this man loves me. Because it says, the flame thereof, the fire of love thereof, is like a vehement heat. How can you stay near fire and not feel warm? My husband, since we got married, Except outside, where you smile and you're free, and everybody thinks you're a great, great man. But over here at home, you're always quiet, meditative. And you're always just going your way. And it's like, you know, uh, my feeling is that you don't love me. Ah, my wife, since we've been together, you should study me, understand me. You know, I, I don't know how to make people feel that I, lo I just love them in my heart. But to express it and to show that I love people, that's just my nature. You shouldn't have gotten married then, if that's your nature. When you get married, what the Lord is expecting is that you will have this love that is as strong as death. And then it says in verse 7, many waters cannot quench love. Many things will happen in the family. Sometimes disagreement because we're thinking in different ways. Sometimes disunity because we're looking in different directions. And because we read different books, we went to different schools, we're brought up by different parents, and we're thinking pattern, they're different. Sometimes we will not see eye to eye, but it is the foundation of love and the source of love and the spring of love that still makes us to come together and we're still able to channel our lives together. And discussion, all that's superficial. Ideas, that's superficial. And then items to decide about those things are superficial beneath the superficial surface of disagreement on what clothes do I wear and what food do I, do I cook what's the color of the you know utensil and the kitchen what is this what be, beyond those superficial things there is a death a spring of love and it says many waters and many difficulties cannot quench that love I pray it will begin in your family Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 9 in Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 9 live joyfully live joyfully not morose not sad but live joyfully with the wife whom thou lovest all the days of the life of thy vanity all the days of thy life 
which he has given thee under the sun all the days of thy vanity for that is thy portion in this life and in thy labor which thou takest under the sun what if she has been offending me what if uh, he has been offending me what well, the lord has told us what to do if he has been offending you in um, matthew chapter 18 i'm reading verse 21 i would have loved her if she had never offended me i would have been showing that kind of love if she studies me and knows what i want and what i don't want I would have given my heart to this man totally 100% and he would have known that I'm a wife that knows how to love if it were not because of the offenses. And I can never forget those offenses. Look at what Jesus said. In Matthew chapter 18 verse 21, Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me? And I forgive him till seven times. Jesus says unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until, until, tell me out loud, until, seventy times, seven times. How is telling you to divorce your wife? Who is telling you to have malice with your wife? Who is telling you to keep away from your husband? Who is telling you, eh, your husband has offended you like that? Your husband has taken that decision without informing you. Your husband went to the mother and they decided everything. And then she didn't. And you are still smiling and cooking and ironing clothes and doing everything. And staying in the same car with that man. You can't teach that man a lesson. Ah. If you don't teach that man a lesson and show that you are not an idiot. And you know how to bring a man on his knees. If you don't teach him a lesson, he'll continue like that. You know all those people that are counseling you and telling you to you treat your husband or to abandon your wife and to hold on to their offenses and never forgive, they are different from Jesus. But today things are different. We will forgive. I said we will forgive. And then after this, as you go back home, and then see now, my wife, I forgive you. My husband, I forgive you. And then will not be playing hand, hide and seek game in the family anymore in Jesus' name. I come to point number three. God's perfect way to the heavenly habitation. God's perfect way to the heavenly habitation. We're told in Isaiah chapter 30. Isaiah chapter 30. I'm reading from verse 19. Isaiah 30 verse 19. For the people shall dwell in Zion at Jerusalem. Thou shalt weep no more. Amen. Amen. He will be gracious unto thee at the voice of thy cry. When he shall hear it, he will answer thee. And though the Lord give thee the bread of adversity and the, and the water of affliction, yet shall not thy teachers be removed into a corner anymore. But thine eyes shall see thy teachers. And thine ears shall hear a word behind thee, saying, This is the way, walk ye in it. When ye turn to the right and when ye turn to the left, the Lord has shown us the perfect way today and the permanent way today. And the Lord is saying, walk ye in it, we shall walk in this way. Psalm 119 verse 89. Psalm 119 verse 89. It tells us, forever, O Lord, Thy word is settled in heaven. This is the word of the Lord. It is settled in heaven. We will walk in this way. In verse 30, in verse 30, it says, I have chosen the way of truth. Thy judgments have I laid before me. I have chosen the way of truth. 
and thy judgments have I laid before me. Verse 128, Therefore I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things to be right. I hate every false way, every wrong way or false way that we have practiced in the past in our marriage, we hate them and abandon them now. From today, we're going to walk in this perfect way of the Lord in Jesus' name. And the Lord will bless you. Isaiah chapter 58. Isaiah chapter 58. The Lord is revealing to us that he himself is going to bless us. He tells us from verse 8, from verse 7, it's not is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry? And that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house. When thou seest the naked, thou dost cover him. And that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh. Your wife, your husband, don't hide yourself again. Open up. Talk to one another. Fellowship together, discuss together, share together, plan together. Don't hold on. The bank account together. Get everything together. And everything you're thinking about the future, your own joy, your own life, everything that you have in mind, don't hide yourself from your flesh, that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh. Then thy light shall spring forth, break forth, as the morning, and thy hell shall spring forth speedily, thy righteousness shall go before thee. The glory of the Lord shall be thy rear word. Then thou shalt call, and the Lord shall answer. Thou shalt cry, and the Lord shall say, Here I am. If thou take away from the means to be the yoke, Break every yoke in your family. Don't put a yoke on your wife. Don't put a yoke on your husband. And then it says, the putting forth of the finger, all the accusation, accusing one another, wife accusing husband, wife, uh, husband accusing wife, and the pointing of the finger, take that away from today. If you draw your soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall thy light rise in obscurity and thy darkness as the noonday. The Lord shall guide thee continually. Continually. And the Lord will satisfy your soul in drought and make fat thy bones, and thou shalt be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters fail not. Your water will not fail, your happiness will not end. And they that shall be of thee, your children, shall build the old waste places, and thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations, and thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach. And the restorer of paths to dwell in. Let's rise up and tell the Lord, I will be a repairer. I'll not be a destroyer. Repair your marriage. Repair the conditions of that family. Love one another. Appreciate one another. Bless one another. And embrace one another. Wipe the tears away. And let us begin a life of happy marriage and a blessed family. And the Lord will bless the work of your hand. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm going to live by this precept of the Lord. My life, I'm not going to hide from my wife anymore. My mind, I'm not going to hide from my husband anymore. We're going to repair all the broken walls of fellowship in our family. The broken walls of love in our family. And we're going to do exactly what the Lord had said. One flesh... Living father and living mother, cleaving together, rejoicing together, sharing together, walking together, enjoying life together, doing everything together, being appreciative of one another, and taking all the accusations away, all the pointing of the finger, taking everything away, living in harmony, living in love, so that... The Lord will repair everything that is broken in our families. The Lord can give you a happy home, blessed marriage, blessed family, even from this day onward.